Welcome to the Cheating Wife Stories channel. After I left a voicemail for my wife, Molly, who I'd been married to for five years, I glanced at my phone one more time. I had just closed a huge service deal with a major company out here in California, one with offices across the country. I knew my boss, Brad Hunt, would be thrilled. This contract spelled growth for our IT firm and a solid bump in my salary. Maybe now, I thought, Molly and I could start that family we'd always talked about. But something was gnawing at me. Ever since I got back from a recent camping trip with Brad, Molly hadn't been herself. She seemed distant, snapping at me over the smallest things. It wasn't just her mood. Right after I got home, I noticed something odd on her underwear while doing laundry. It had a texture and a strong scent I couldn't ignore. The realization hit me like a punch and I felt my world starting to unravel. Desperate to get to the truth, I decided to meet with an attorney before heading back out to the West Coast. If Molly had betrayed me, I knew there'd be no going back. I reached out to a lawyer, Lydia Hammond, a specialist in family law and divorce, recommended by a friend who had just gone through a messy split himself. Are you sure Molly's cheating on you? Lydia asked after I explained my suspicions. Not 100%, I admitted, but I need to know. If she has, I want a divorce. Divorces here don't typically assign fault, Lydia explained. You could file for infidelity, but you'll need solid proof, photographs, videos, that kind of thing. What exactly would I need? I asked, feeling a pang of dread. An investigator could find out for sure, if you'd like, she said. I nodded and she offered to arrange it. Since you both earn about the same and don't have property or kids, it'll be a straightforward split. If infidelity is proven, we can use that to secure a more favorable outcome for you. All right, let's do it, I agreed. I'll be gone for about three days, so maybe that's when it'll happen. She contacted her investigator, Rick Simmons, who suggested I add a tracking app to Molly's phone and even offered a device to record our landline calls, along with a small audio recorder for her purse. I hated resorting to this, but I needed to know. As days went by, even Brad started acting differently, like he knew something I didn't. It only made my gut churn harder. Finally, the day came. Molly drove me to the airport, kissed me goodbye, and I promised to call that evening. When I did, she surprised me by mentioning she'd be waitressing at a party Brad was hosting. Okay, but be careful, I said, trying to sound casual. Just tell me about it tomorrow. Sure, she replied. You know I love you, right? I love you too, Molly, I said, hanging up with a knot in my stomach. Right after, I called Rick to let him know where she'd be that night. We'll keep an eye on her and update you, he assured me. The next day, I tried calling Molly's cell, but there was no answer. I called our landline, but again, just the machine. Telling myself she couldn't have spent the night at Brad's, I pushed through the day until an email came from Rick. Molly spent the night at Brad's place, and is still there. He attached photos, ones I won't forget any time soon. She hadn't just been with Brad. There were two other men, guys I used to call friends. My hands started shaking as I stared at those pictures. I could hardly breathe, let alone think. I tried calling her again, only to get her voicemail. So I headed down to the hotel bar to drown my anger. By morning, I checked the tracker, and sure enough, her phone was still at Brad's. Rick's follow-up email confirmed it, with more pictures showing her with a large group that included Brad's son Matt and several employees from Brad's IT team. I felt sick to my core. With the contract signed, I packed up, checked out of the hotel, and caught an early flight home. When I arrived, Molly's car was gone, so I went inside to change. I called Lydia, and her receptionist said she'd be able to see me that afternoon. When Molly finally picked up her phone, she sounded a little breathless. Hey, it's me, I said, trying to keep my tone even. Where are you? I'm at home she replied, sounding composed, just wrapping up a few things before classes start. I bit down on my frustration. All right, 
Well, I'm finished out here in California and on my way back. Oh, all right, she responded, her tone soft. I miss you so much. Call me when you land, and I'll come pick you up at the airport. No need, I replied. I'll just grab a taxi. I hung up, noting how I hadn't told her I loved her or said anything about looking forward to seeing her. She probably noticed. With a sigh, I left the house to visit Lydia. Meanwhile, I imagined Molly looking at her phone, confused. Normally, I ended every call by telling her I loved her, but not this time. She'd initially planned to come home after that first night, but lying between Brad and his son felt too enticing to leave. She convinced herself it'd all end when classes resumed, that I'd never know. So she stayed another night, welcoming Brad back when he got home from work to find her with his son, Matt, on his bed. Brad just smirked and said, Maybe I should send your husband on trips more often. You know I have classes starting soon. She chuckled, as if this whole thing was a game. Well, maybe I'll make sure he's gone for another weekend, Brad suggested. Then you can visit us again. It does sound fun, she replied with a smirk. But at some point, he'll find out. Mason's not an idiot. Brad shrugged and picked up a video camera. Don't worry. I'll take care of Mason. But here's the thing. I don't want you with him anymore. You're ours now. Got it. All right, she muttered. I'll think of something. And just like that, Molly turned into someone I didn't recognize. Enjoying attention from Brad's friends and colleagues, she acted like she was at some twisted party. When I finally saw all the evidence Rick collected, it hit me hard. There were photos, even two DVDs of her with multiple men, doing things she'd never do with me. Watching it was like watching a stranger. Lydia tried to offer some consolation, but it was clear there was no going back. Why would she do this? I muttered, still shocked by the betrayal after five years together, and Brad, too, someone I thought was a friend. We'll proceed with the divorce and cite infidelity, Lydia confirmed. I can also file a lawsuit for alienation of affection against Brad and the others. It may not go far, but we could get a decent settlement. Do what you have to, I said, my voice hollow. After I left Lydia's office, I scrolled through my contacts until I found Gabriel Nelson's numbers, CEO of Empire. Nelson here, Gabriel answered. Gabriel, it's Mason. Mason Ford. Mason, it's been a while, he replied warmly. How are things? Could be better, I admitted. Is that opening still available at Empire? Gabriel had been trying to recruit me for some time but out of loyalty to Brad, I'd turned him down. Now that loyalty was gone. Of course it's still open, Gabriel replied. Have you finally decided to join a respectable team? Yeah, something like that, I said, holding back the full truth. Let's just say I've realized I can't stay where I am anymore. Understood, Mason. Just come by tonight at 6.30. Rose makes a lasagna to die for. Thanks, I said, ending the call and feeling a weight lift off my shoulders. With Gabriel's job offer confirmed, the future looked clearer. I started the car and headed home, where Molly was still nowhere to be found. I grabbed my briefcase, took a long shower, and sat down at the computer to write up my resignation letter. Around five o'clock, Molly finally showed up, and when she saw me at the computer, she came over to kiss me. I turned away, and she awkwardly planted one on my cheek. Everything okay? She asked, looking a little taken aback. Not really, I replied. I'm not feeling well, probably jet lag or something. I'll just sleep on the futon tonight. You're going out? She asked, frowning. Will you be coming back? I have dinner plans, I told her, ignoring the flicker of concern in her eyes. Are you meeting a woman? She asked, sounding tense. You're wondering if I'm cheating on you. I responded. I haven't cheated on you once in all our years together, and I have no intention of starting now. Can you say the same? Her face paled as she stammered. Of course I can. She tried to brush it off, asking. So, 
How did the trip go? Good, I replied curtly. How was your little job at Brad's? It went well, she said, her eyes darting away for a moment. Even when it was tough, it was fun. I bet, I replied flatly, glancing at my watch. I stood up. I should go. I saved my work, turned off the computer, and headed to the bedroom to change into something a bit more formal. When I came out, Molly was still sitting on the sofa. How long will you be out? She asked, trying to sound casual. Not sure. Don't wait up for me, I replied, heading for the door without another word or gesture. She watched as I left, likely noticing that I hadn't kissed her goodbye or said I loved her, something I always did. As soon as I pulled out of the driveway, she reached for the phone and called Brad, unaware that her every word was being recorded. Brad, I think he knows something, she said, sounding anxious. What makes you think that? He replied. He hasn't touched me. Usually he kisses me, says he loves me. But tonight, he was just cold. He said he had dinner plans but didn't say with whom. So what if he knows? Brad replied nonchalantly. You can always come stay with us. Don't worry about Mason. I'll keep him busy enough that he's barely ever home. But I don't want to lose him, Brad, she insisted. I still love him. Brad laughed. Yeah, sure you do. You've shown us all how much you love him these past couple of days, haven't you? Stop, she said sharply. I know what I did, and I liked it, but that doesn't mean I want to lose Mason. Brad's tone turned dismissive. Look, just give him time. He'll come around. If he doesn't, we'll deal with it. You're ours now, and you'll help us keep things in line. You wouldn't want the school board seeing that footage, would you? You wouldn't dare, she whispered, horrified. Oh, but I'd love to, he sneered. There's plenty of video of you in compromising positions, so you better make sure little Mason behaves. Her defeated sigh was the last thing I heard before the recording ended. I clenched my jaw, trying to push down the disgust rising in me as I pulled up in front of Gabriel and Rose Nelson's two-story house. I grabbed the bottle of wine I'd picked up on the way and rang the doorbell. Gabriel opened it with a welcoming smile and accepted the wine with a nod. Come on in, Mason. Thanks for bringing this. It'll go perfectly with dinner he said, leading me into the dining room where Rose was setting the table. Mason, meet my wife. Rose. Rose, this is Mason Ford, our new operations manager. Gabriel introduced us. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Nelson. I said, shaking her hand. Please, call me Rose. Mrs. Nelson sounds too formal. She replied with a warm smile. We took our seats and Rose served her lasagna while Gabriel poured the wine. The food was incredible, and I couldn't help but tell her, this is the best lasagna I've ever had. I'm glad you like it, Rose said. It's one of my favorite recipes. After some small talk, Gabriel gave me a curious look. So Mason, what made you decide to leave Brad's firm so suddenly? I hesitated, then nodded. It's a long story. I said, collecting my thoughts before sharing everything with them. By the time I finished, Gabriel shook his head, looking genuinely shocked. Unbelievable, he said. I'm sorry, Mason. Something similar happened to me once, though not under these circumstances. So, besides taking this job, what's next? I filed for divorce, I admitted. My lawyer says it should be a straightforward split, given the circumstances. Rose looked at me sympathetically. Have you considered counseling? I shook my head. It's gone too far. I don't even know who she is anymore. How are you holding up? Rose asked gently. Honestly, not well. My lawyer suggested I try to act normal around her, but it's tough. I can barely look at her. You know, seeing the psychologist could help, Rose offered. I'd be glad to talk with you if you're open to it. Gabriel smiled and added, Rose is incredible at what she does. She was a godsend for me when I went through a rough patch. I thought about it for a moment. I'd appreciate that, Rose, I said, nodding. Good man, Gabriel said, patting my shoulder. Take the time you need. 
just let us know, and we'll work it into your schedule. We wrapped up dinner, and Gabriel took me to his office to go over my new role over a glass of brandy. We spent the next couple of hours discussing the position, the team, and the projects I'd be managing. By the time we finished, I felt like I was finally taking control of my life again. I shook Gabriel's hand and thanked him before heading home. When I arrived around 10 p.m., I saw the lights still on and walked in to find Molly sitting on the sofa. She looked up and asked, How did the meeting go? It went well. Thank you. I replied curtly. Now, if you don't mind, I'll be heading to bed. I went into the spare bedroom, where I'd set up my computer, and started undressing. Molly appeared in the doorway. Are you sleeping in here now? I told you, I'm not feeling well. The fuflin is fine. I said, brushing her off. She hesitated. It's just, you were gone for a few days, and I thought maybe we could, you know. I'm not in the mood, I said, feeling a wave of disgust just thinking about it. Okay, maybe tomorrow, she asked, her voice barely a whisper. I didn't answer, and she turned away, probably wondering if I knew anything. The next morning, I got up early, grabbed my resignation letter, and downloaded the audio from her phone call with Brad. Without saying a word to Molly, I left the house. By the time I reached the office, I barely greeted anyone. I headed straight to my office and started packing up. Brad came in, looking confused. What's going on? He asked. I handed him two envelopes, one containing the signed contract from California, the other my resignation. I'm done, effective immediately. I expect my bonus, final salary, and any unused vacation pay. Resignation? Are you serious? He stammered. Why are you leaving? Don't act like you don't know, I replied coldly. I'm not some fool, Brad. I can't work here anymore, so I'm leaving for another company. Wait, Mason, can we talk about this? He pleaded. There's nothing to talk about. I thought we were friends, but you stabbed me in the back and ruined my marriage. I said, holding back the anger surging inside. Oh, come on, he scoffed. It's not like I forced her. Molly was more than willing. Is that what you think? I asked, incredulous. How long has this been going on? Brad leaned back, smirking. Since that camping trip, actually. That second day, when you were skiing, she came to me practically begging. Even mentioned that I'm, let's say, better than you. So that's why you made me leave that day, right? So you could have her all to yourself. I demanded, feeling my blood boil. Brad didn't deny it. Why not? And hiring her as a waitress at the party. Just another chance for some fun, he said with a twisted grin. I took my phone out, stopping the recording I'd started the moment Brad entered my office. Thanks for your confession, I said coolly. Now, if you don't mind, I'm heading down to HR. Goodbye, Brad. Wait, he said, scrambling. You can't use that recording. We'll see about that, I replied. Goodbye, Brad. I hope you rot in hell. I grabbed my things and walked out, feeling more finality in that moment than ever before. As I reached the door, I heard him call after me. Hey, you forgot something. I glanced back to see him holding up a framed photo of Molly that had been on my desk for years. Keep it, I said. If you and your son want her so much, she's all yours. I'm done with that. I walked away, leaving Brad in shock. On my drive home, my phone buzzed with a call from Molly. She sounded frantic. He resigned. What do you mean? She demanded after Brad informed her. Yeah, he just handed in a signed contract and a resignation letter, Brad explained. He knows Molly. I don't know how, but he does. What did you tell him? She asked, panicked. The truth, Brad answered. I told him about our time together on that hike. You idiot. She snapped, her voice choked with frustration. And what about the photo of me he kept? Oh, he didn't want it, Brad said. Told me to keep it. Guess he's really done with you. Molly was crying now. So, what do we do? She asked, 
defeated. Not my problem, Brad replied dismissively. He's your husband. You figure it out. Unless, of course, you want me to step in and make him see things our way. No, she whispered. You've done enough. Just stay out of it. I'll handle things. Brad gave an unbothered laugh. As you wish, and hung up. When I pulled into my driveway, I saw Molly's car parked outside. I checked around, making sure Brad's wasn't anywhere nearby, then grabbed my things and headed inside. Molly was sitting on the couch, her eyes puffy and red. Without a word, I went into my home office, locked the door, and pulled up the recordings of her conversation with Brad. Listening to her unraveling panic as she tried to explain things with Brad made me feel both vindicated and sick. I forwarded the file to Lydia, then called her. Mason, she answered. I just got your email. I'm finalizing your documents now. When can they be submitted? I asked, eager to close this chapter. If you want, I can arrange for them to be delivered later today, she replied. I thanked her, hung up, and went into the kitchen, where Molly sat, avoiding my gaze. I set my briefcase down and looked her in the eye. We need to talk, I said, placing my old forty-five on the table within reach. She flinched. Is that really necessary? She asked, staring at the gun. I hope not, I replied coldly. But if your lover decides to pay a visit, I want to be ready. My lover, she stammered, looking genuinely shocked. Don't play dumb, Molly. I'm not in the mood for games. I pointed to the seat across from me, and she sat down, trembling. Later today, someone's coming by with papers for you, I said. Her face paled. Papers? You mean, divorce? That's right, I said, my tone unyielding. I know everything about Brad, his son, and the others you were with. I filed for divorce on grounds of infidelity. She shook her head, denying it. You don't have any proof, she insisted. Oh, don't I? I reached into an envelope and laid out time-stamped photos, each one showing her in compromising positions with multiple men, including Brad. I also have video and audio. Would you like to watch? She dropped her head, realization dawning that any denial would be useless. Fine, she whispered. Considering the circumstances, I'm being fair, no alimony half of what's in the bank, and we keep our separate pensions. I canceled your credit card, and here's a cashier's check for your share of the remaining balance. There's also a restraining order requiring you to stay at least 500 feet away from me, my home, and my workplace. Tears rolled down her cheeks as she asked. So you're kicking me out? Yes, you'll have time to pack up your things before you serve the papers. What if I contest this? She asked her voice shaking with desperation. I laughed. Do you really think that's wise? How would your school board react if I sent them these photos and videos? Do you think parents would want you teaching their kids? Her shoulders slumped as she nodded. You wouldn't do that, would you? Are you willing to risk it? I asked, my tone icy. She shook her head, defeated. Fine, she muttered. Hand over your rings and plan to revert to your maiden name. It's part of the deal. Molly looked at me, stunned. You've become so cold, so heartless. I learned from the best, I replied. I have one question. What happened to you? How did you go from a loving wife to this? She couldn't look at me. It happened on that camping trip, she murmured. You were on the lake, and I was resting in the tent. Brad walked by and saw me undressed. He came in, and well, it just happened. So, just like that, some guy walks in, and you're ready to throw away everything we had. I asked, my voice full of contempt. How many times did it happen during that trip? Twice, she admitted, once when you were skiing, and then again when he sent you back to the office. I shook my head, pointing at the photos. I noticed none of these men used protection. You weren't concerned about getting pregnant or catching something. I'm on the pill, she muttered. Doesn't make it foolproof, I replied. Did you ever think about the risks or were you just that reckless? Oh God, no, 
she whispered, covering her face. You know, over the years, I had opportunities to stray. I told her, women far more attractive than you. But I never took them because I thought I had a loyal, faithful wife. Now I realize I was living in a fantasy. I pointed to the pile of bags she had gathered. Go pack. Anything you leave behind will be burned or donated. She begged, can't we try counseling? Please, I'll change, I promise. I stared at her, feeling the numbness settle in. I will never forgive you for this, Molly. Not after everything you've done. Now, pack your things. Whatever's left will be gone by tomorrow. Tears streaming, she packed one bag after another, glancing at me one last time. Can you at least help me carry these to the car? No, I replied. It's your trash. You take it. And remember, if you leave anything, even that wedding dress, it'll be gone by tomorrow. My wedding dress. My parents spent thousands on that. She cried. Then you better take it if you care so much. I said, turning away as she carried bag after bag to her car. Two hours later, she was exhausted. I can't fit anything else in the car. Can I come back for the rest? No, you can arrange for someone to get it, but you're not coming near this house, I replied. There's a restraining order against you. She gave me a weary, tearful look. What will I tell my parents? Try the truth for a change, I said. Tell them you cheated on me with my boss and several others. If I tell them that, they'll disown me, she said. Not my problem, I replied coldly. But if you try to paint me as the villain, you know they'll find out the whole story. Just then, there was a knock on the door. I looked at her. That's for you. Molly answered, opening the door to a sheriff's deputy. Are you Molly Ford? He asked. She nodded and he handed her an envelope. You've been served, he said. You're required to vacate the premises immediately. With tears rolling down her cheeks, she signed the papers and looked back at me. I'm so sorry, she whispered. Yeah, me too. Goodbye, Molly, I said. She left without another word, escorted by the deputy. The next few days were a blur, but I didn't hear from her again. Brad, though, called twice, leaving threatening messages. Mason, I know you're there. He barked in one. Drop this lawsuit, or I swear I'll make you pay. I saved the voicemail and sent it to Lydia, who immediately involved the sheriff's department. Molly's parents, Todd and Freya, called soon after, asking if they could pick up her things. I agreed, telling them to ensure she stayed away. When they arrived, they tried to talk me out of the divorce. She just made a mistake, Freya said tearfully. Surely you can forgive her. What did she tell you? I asked. She said she had a fight with your boss. Freya replied, clearly confused. I took out the envelope of photos and DVDs, laying them out on the table. Their faces fell as they saw the images. I'm sorry she didn't tell you the truth, I said. It was much worse than she made it seem. Oh, Mason, Freya whispered, horrified. I had no idea. Todd's face turned red with rage. I'm going to have a word with our daughter, he said, loading the last of her things. They both hugged me tightly before they left. Later that evening, there was another knock on my door. I checked the peephole and saw Brad, his son Matt, and two of my former colleagues. Quickly, I went to my office, grabbed my gun, and called 911, keeping the weapon hidden behind my back. I barely managed to open the door before they stormed inside, Brad leading the charge. I'm going to teach you a lesson, you piece off. He snarled, stepping forward menacingly. I pulled out my pistol and aimed it right at him. That froze him and his buddies in their tracks. You really want to test me? I asked, my voice steady. Just so you know, I've already called emergency services. The cops are on their way. If you're still here when they show up, you'll all be arrested for violating the restraining order. Ah, Brad, I think he's serious, muttered one of the guys, glancing nervously at the flashing red and blue lights pulling up outside. Yeah, Brad, I'm serious. 
I confirmed as the police sirens grew louder. They turned to leave, but it was too late. Two uniformed officers were already standing in the doorway. One of the officers took charge. Put the weapon down, sir, he said to me firmly. I placed the gun on the kitchen table and raised my hands in compliance. Officer, I said, nodding toward Brad and his friends, these men violated a restraining order, broke into my home, and threatened me. I'd like them arrested. Do you have a copy of the order? One of the officers asked. I pulled an envelope from the kitchen drawer, handing it over. The officer studied it briefly before turning to the four men. Turn around and put your hands behind your back, he ordered. The officers cuffed them, reading them their rights. Brad glared at me, but I just stood back, watching as they were led away. Do you have a license for this firearm? One of the officers asked. Yes, officer, I do, I replied, showing him my driver's license and firearm certification. He nodded, giving me a word of caution. Be careful with that, he said. Understood. Thank you, officer, I replied, feeling a strange sense of relief as the police finally left. The next three months passed quickly, with life settling into a new routine. Working at Empire was far more fulfilling than my time with Brad's company had ever been. Rose's weekly counseling sessions helped me work through the lingering anger and trust issues, and I'd even picked up a few new habits. I started hitting the gym three times a week, joined a martial arts class for mental discipline, and even followed a diet and fitness program Rose recommended. The divorce itself was straightforward. Molly didn't contest it. But the alienation of affection lawsuit was another story. Lydia warned me that these cases were tough. But remarkably, two of the defendants were eventually fired due to the publicity. The case against Brad, however, was the one that shocked us all. After hearing testimony and reviewing Lydia's evidence, including Brad's financials, the judge ruled in my favor, awarding a judgment of $1 million. At the end of the trial, the judge had some words for Brad. Mr. Hunt, he began, looking down at him with clear disapproval, your conduct in this case is appalling. Not only did you betray a man who considered you a friend, but you also used your position to destroy his marriage and personal life. I find in favor of the plaintiff and order one million dollars in damages. Brad's lawyer stood up, protesting. Your Honor, this ruling is highly unusual. The judge shot him a cold look. Not as unusual as your client's behavior. If restitution isn't paid immediately, he can serve time in jail for contempt. Case closed. He banged his gavel, signaling the end of it. Brad, clearly defeated, handed his lawyer a check, which ultimately made its way to Lydia, who passed it to me. To my surprise, the check cleared without issue, allowing me to pay Lydia her share. As news of the lawsuit spread, several of Brad's clients reached out to me, unwilling to do business with someone so willing to destroy another man's life. With business drying up, it seemed Brad was on the path to bankruptcy. During all of this, I kept my distance from dating, even though a few women at the company showed interest. I was still technically a married man until the divorce was finalized, and I wanted to do things right. When it finally was over, I celebrated quietly with friends from work. A couple of months later, Molly's mother, Freya, called me out of the blue. Mason, it's Freya. Do you have a moment? She asked. Of course, Freya. I said, wondering what this was about. It's Molly, she said, her voice shaking. She's HIV positive. She just got her test results. I'm sorry to hear that, I said, but honestly, I wasn't surprised. We're officially divorced now, so there's nothing I can do. I understand, she replied softly. But I was hoping you might consider speaking to her. She's not handling this well. I sighed, unsure if it would help but finally agreed. All right, Freya. I'll come by for a few minutes. When I arrived, I was shocked to see how much Molly had changed. She looked thin and frail, nothing like the woman I once knew. She tried to approach me, but I held up my hand, keeping my distance. Saddened, she sat on the sofa and motioned for me to join her. You look good, Mason, she said weakly, offering a sad smile. 
better than I remember. How have you been? I'm doing okay, Molly. New job, new friends, new outlook. How are you holding up? Not well, she admitted, barely able to meet my gaze. You know I'm HIV positive now. Your mom told me. I said, I'm sorry to hear that. Do you know when it happened? I think it happened during one of those days with Brad, she confessed. I, I was with multiple men, and none of them used protection. I nodded, letting her words sink in. Does Brad know? Not yet, she replied, her voice barely a whisper. But I'll have to tell him soon. I shook my head, unable to fathom the mesh he had entangled herself in. Well, I'm sure he won't take it well, I said, knowing Brad's temper. No, probably not, she agreed. She took a deep breath, looking down at her hands. Mason, I just want to say, I'm sorry. I realize now how many lives I ruined. I had the best husband anyone could ask for. And I threw it all away. I know you probably hate me. And you have every right to. But I don't want to leave this world without knowing if you can forgive me. For the first time, I felt that she truly understood the weight of her actions. I could see how deeply she regretted it, and I remembered Rose's advice about forgiveness. Holding on to anger would only hold me back. All right, Molly, I said, nodding slowly. I forgive you. Tears streamed down her face as she whispered, Thank you. That means more to me than you'll ever know. She composed herself and added, You deserve to be happy, Mason. Find someone to love and trust. Have a family and move on. I will, I replied, appreciating the sentiment. And if you ever need someone to talk to, let me know. She nodded, wiping her eyes. I will. Thank you for coming, Mason. I've missed you. I missed the woman I married, I said gently. By the way, how are things with Brad and Matt? She shook her head. It's not good. Brad's become even more abusive since the lawsuit, and his business is falling apart. He's been very harsh with me lately. Do you want me to be there when you tell him about your diagnosis? I asked. No, but thank you. I need to do this alone. We said our goodbyes, and as I left, Freya hugged me tightly. Thank you, Mason. It meant the world to her, and to me. A couple of weeks later, while I was eating dinner, a news report caught my attention. Local businessmen and two others found dead in suspected murder-suicide, the anchor announced. Brad Hunt, his son, and an unidentified woman were found with fatal gunshot wounds. Authorities are investigating and will release more details soon. I froze, reaching for my phone and dialing Freya. She answered, sobbing. Freya, I just saw the news. Was it? It was her, Mason. She choked out. Brad shot her, then his son, and finally himself. Oh my God. I'm so sorry, I whispered, feeling a wave of sadness. I know Mason, she said, her voice breaking. I think she told him about her diagnosis. And he snapped. They're doing an autopsy now. I never wanted any of this, Freya. I hope you know that. I do, Mason. Thank you for making peace with her. I like to think she's at peace now. I hope so, I said quietly. Let me know if there's anything I can do. At Molly's memorial, I was there with her parents, paying my last respects. The autopsy revealed that Brad and Matt had both been HIV positive as well. Apparently, when Brad and Matt learned of their diagnosis, everything spiraled. Molly had tried to suggest they all get tested, but upon hearing the news, Brad had snapped taking her life, his son's, and finally his own. It was tragic, and it all felt so senseless. I spent the next few days reflecting on everything, mourning not only the loss of the woman I once loved, but the life I thought we'd share. The memories of our good years lingered, a bittersweet reminder of what once was. Then one day, as I was getting ready to leave the office, Tracy, one of my co-workers, stopped by. Hey, Mason. She said with a warm smile. Would you like to join us for happy hour tonight? I figured you might need a little company. For a moment, I almost turned her down. 
The idea of putting myself out there again felt foreign and a bit daunting, but then a thought crossed my mind. Life was moving forward, and maybe I should too. What the hell, I said, smiling back at her. I could use some good company. Well then, she replied, her smile widening. We'll see you at Hitchhikers after work. As she left, I leaned back in my chair, a strange but welcome sense of peace settling over me. The cycle of life continued, and for the first time in a long while, I felt ready to see where it might take me next. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.